everybody tonight we are starting what we hope to be a series of history episodes about surrounding cities outside of petaluma now we record this show in the phoenix theater obviously petaluma california and we've done it on the stage and we've done a number of these about petaluma but tonight we are very excited to venture into the history of calistoga california now this is a town that Tom and I both love very much. Yes, um, I have personally spent a lot of time there, and it holds an important space in my own life's path. And as with our other history episodes, our goal here is to zero in on the characters and the stories and the events that are the most colorful and showcase the soul of Calistoga's history. Yeah, and Calistoga has quite a colorful history with with just some really good, great characters to read and learn about and and hear their stories about. You've been hanging out with them for like the last. I have. A couple weeks at least. <laughs> it's true. Haven't had much, much else to do, so it's been me and Calistoga pioneers. Well, we are very fortunate to have a guest phoning in tonight who has spent a lot of her life studying and sharing the history of Napa Valley, and that is author and historian Rebecca Yerger. She writes for the Napa Valley Register, and she has a focus on the area's history. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Tom, you've spent a lot of time with Calistoga in the last few weeks. Do you have any general thoughts before we start? Well, it's a beautiful little town. And as you read it, uh, as you read about it and, and delve into their history a little bit, you realize it, it, it seems to share like stories with most of the communities in Sonoma and Lake and Napa counties. You, you start looking at their city's histories and you realize, oh my gosh, first off, a lot of these characters did intertwine. And there's a lot of, of blood that has lasted through the years that have gone on to uh, be businessmen and families and businesswomen and uh, just people that are people in our counties today. And it's fun to hear these, these names that we are familiar with now uh, going back 100 to 150 years ago. This has been an awful lot of fun reading this. Rebecca, anything on your end about Calistoga? I know you're a, you're a Napa woman, but Calistoga obviously factors into the Napa County lore. Oh, definitely. It's, well, it's one of the main places where people settled in the earliest of days, you know, as far as the pioneer settlers. Uh, there was a large um, enclave there. So it, it was very important to the history and development of Napa County, Napa Valley. And it's a, a wonderful community uh, today, and it's much more than just um, resorts and restaurants. It has a really deep history which I hope to share some of that with you this you know, evening. It's, it actually started as a settlement, uh, more so than, than, than a, a, a place to do business. Uh, it seems to me that people were drawn to it, its uh, wonderful environment. Uh, it, it's easy growing and it's great climate. And people were actually coming with, with settling and living there in mind. Well, when you look at, I mean, Napa County, it wasn't a place to come for... Um, you know, mining and that sort of right. thing. It was a lot of people that came here were farmers. That's what they were looking for. You know, land where they can uh, grow their crops and make a living, and um, you know, the rural agricultural life. You know, um, so when I was a kid, uh, my dad was uh, my my godfather had come to town, and he was a builder in Redwood City, and uh, we'd driven out uh, East Washington Street. And my dad was motioning over uh, uh, south on Washington, these huge empty fields, except for they were full blossoming with mustard plant, mustard weed. We called it weed. And it was just such a gorgeous thing to see. Uh, hundreds of acres of, of this bright golden mustard. And uh, as I was studying Calistoga, I began to learn where this came from. Uh, the mustard was not a native plant to this area, but there's a story about... Uh, when one of the first uh, um, Mexicans went up to take a look at the area, the Russians were starting to encroach in the area. The, the Mexican government felt that the Russians were going to be encroaching. So they started moving uh, um, missions out, and Vallejo and his soldiers came out. And one Padre Jose Altamira uh, decided to make the trek up to this area where he'd heard about these springs. And he took his, his crew up with him, and in order to find his way back, he put a hole in a sack of mustard seed, 
and that sack of mustard seed dropped seeds all the way and left this beautiful trail so that he could find his way back. At least that's the story I read. I think that's fascinating, and I'm wondering if this was the beginning of where we all this beautiful mustard that used to be all over our county and, and all over Napa and, and uh, Lake Counties, and I'm wondering if that was one of the first times that it was introduced to our area. Well, as you said, it's not indigenous to this area. It was definitely introduced out from elsewhere. And the story goes, as you said, the uh, uh, Jose Altamira was supposedly responsible for it. And there were two versions. One, he has such a love for the condiment of mustard. He took the seeds everywhere he went and just scattered them. And uh, that's a quick summary of the yeah. story. And the other one is the fact that he was, um, shall we say, directionally challenged. <laughs> and uh, he did not uh, enjoy being teased by his uh, fellow um, uh, members and of his, uh, you know, his group that he was going around with. And so he did the thing with a, a pouch full of seeds. And there was a small, like, drawstring. That's the version I've heard. Got it. And he would discreetly... Um, open the little um, opening with the drawstring. And as he walked along, you know, he would leave a trail for himself. And it was very discreet, but he knew where it was, and then he could make his way back to the rest of the party. You bet. If it was so, after they, they blossomed, it would give you a great bright trail to follow home. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, either way, I suppose we have um, a Jesuit priest to thank for the mustard that That's we see in early spring, you know, late winter, early spring. Yeah. It's a beautiful uh, sight to see. Yeah, thank you, uh, Padre Altamira. Just out of curiosity, do you want to tell the story associated with um, Altamira about naming of Mount St. Helena? I'd love to hear that. That's 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 a great one, as a matter of fact. Because there were, uh, absolutely, there were three different possibilities as to why it was named uh, St. Helena, as I recall. There are three versions, uh, as you mentioned, uh, involving three different parties. There is the first one that involves uh, Russian explorers yes. from uh, Fort, uh, Fort Ross. Uh, they can see Mount St. Helena can actually be seen out to sea by 50 miles, you know, 50 miles out. That's quite a landmark. So, yeah, so you can actually see it from uh, when they were coming into Fort Ross, they could see uh, Mount St. Helena from that vantage point. So they wanted to explore it to see what this uh, landmark was. And when they got there, they named it after a Russian princess. Yeah, who actually, was she in the area at the time? Because there was, there was some, there was a piece of the legend that said she might actually have, have gone with them on the trip and, and climbed up the mountain, which uh, actually turns out to be uh, very improbable. But uh, is that correct? Well, um, it was named after her. She was not present during the uh, expedition. Uh, as far as whether she was at Fort Ross, that I don't know. Okay, yeah. Uh, but she was of Russian royalty. That part is true. Yeah. Um, another one has to do with a um, an American who was coming to California aboard the ship St. Helena. And uh, he was, he actually purchased part of the land that was Fort Ross. This was after the Russians left. And uh, he saw the mountain. And he decided to name it after the ship that he was aboard, which was the St. Helena. St. Helena. It would be Mount St. Helena. And the third one, which involves um, our, our padre, Altamira, uh, when he was approaching, uh, they were coming to Napa County via um, Knights Valley. So you'd be coming in from the west going eastward. And he saw the... Um, the peak from that vantage point, and it took his breath away because it reminded him of a saint. Uh, she was a nun in France that he saw when she was laying in state, and he named it uh, Mount Saint Helena after this particular um, Catholic uh, nun who had received sainthood. See, that's an incredible coincidence, really, that because uh, all of the all three of those stories can be confirmed that that. Uh, uh, that a piece of that mountain was named St. Helena by three different uh, groups. And that's a huge coincidence when you think about that. It's actually um, in three different counties. It'd be Sonoma, Napa, and Lake County. Counties. Is there a spot where you can lay in all three counties at once? 
Uh, probably at that, I don't know for certain, uh, but I'm sure there is. It'd be like the Four Corners, but it might be a rather difficult terrain. That I don't know. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll do it. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're going to do a Calistoga history episode, you have almost got to start with Sam Brannan. I mean, this, yeah. this man is everywhere when you yeah. research this city's history. So mm-hmm. I, I think a, a great place to start here would be going into his personal history a bit, because without that history, the city we're talking about tonight would not look the way that it does today at all. That's true. Sam Brannan lived like a full life before he got to Calistoga. That's true. Oh. And, and, and the thing that's so fun about him is, well, actually, uh, Rebecca, you end your article on him with what his headstone says. <laughs> Sam Brannan, 1819 to 1889, dreamer, leader, and empire builder. And yeah. something about Sam Brannan, um, I mean, you, you he lived 10 lives in one lifetime yeah, he did. between the different professions yeah. that he had and the places that he went and the reputations that he built and the people that he pissed off. I mean, just <laughs> just uh, it, it's surprising the town isn't named after his name in particular, uh, as opposed to the, you know, drunken misspeak that he does later yeah. on in his life. <laughs> That's true. But um, but let's start. I mean, he was born in 1819 and. He uh, he started out in the printing trade as an apprentice, yep. and that's an yeah. important piece of information. He, he was working in the newspaper industry, and mm-hmm. in order to advance his career, and this is all thanks to your article, Rebecca, this, this zoomed out version, uh, when, he was 20, okay. when he was 23, he moved to New York, and um, well, I guess he became a Mormon, <laughs> so, he yeah. could, so he could publish their newspaper. What does that mean? Does that mean that he like sort of cynically became a Mormon? Uh, I think it was a um, a business move. Yeah. It was strictly where he wanted to advance his career. He saw an opportunity, and so he became um, a member of the um, Latter-day Saints or the Mormons. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it was all a um, part of a business plan. Yeah, because he in, in New York, he was ha- actually handling their printing or, or printing for them, wasn't he? Yes, he was, and uh, he saw this opportunity. They wanted a newspaper, and it was around 1842 when he did this. Uh, He became a Mormon, and exclusively for the purpose, uh, as based on the information I was able to find, uh, that he did that so he could be the publisher of their newspaper. Yeah, so, I mean, father of Calistoga, He's now on the East Coast at 23, breaking into the newspaper industry through this backdoor sort of way. I think I'll become yeah. a Mormon. And it worked. Yeah, it I mean, it, and so he's uh, he's doing that. And then in 1846, he was selected to, wow, he was selected with Brigham Young. Yes. They were selected by the church to head west and do an expedition. Yeah. And, and you know, Young went by an overland trip and they ended up in Utah. Yeah. Uh, and then Brannon, with 236 men, women, and children, sailed aboard the Brooklyn yeah. to Yerba Buena, which is San Francisco. Yeah. And they arrived there um, later in 1846. So, such and a remarkable it, thing. Sorry sorry to interrupt, but like Brigham Young is just such a notable figure in that faith. Well, yeah. And uh, Brannon goes on to be the essentially the reason that the town that we're talking about tonight uh, looks the way it does. What are we going to say? It's Tom? possibly, uh, they, it seemed like they had dueling visions. And where Brigham Young was able to, to, to find his way to Salt Lake City and, and put down roots that, that stuck, uh, Sam Brannon. Uh, came all the way around the horn to San Francisco and uh, kind of, I think he stayed with the church, but he got, he spread himself pretty thin. Uh, He started a newspaper in San Francisco pretty quickly. And I think it was the first newspaper in San Francisco in Yerba Buena. Now, before he does that, does he go to Sacramento first uh, or does San Francisco come first? Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they arrived in San Francisco, they being this entire party of Mormons. And then I do have to mention that it was not a pleasure cruise that they were aboard. Uh, it's a very difficult travel that they um, they accomplished. But anyway, uh, they went from San Francisco to the Sacramento Delta, and they established within you know, one of the Delta Islands. It became known as Mormon Island, and it was a very large farm. And, uh, you know, he was the head of this whole group. He would be like an elder uh, within that church. So he was the head of the group. And um, something that the church did not like, uh, he pocketed 100% of all the tithes. And he also took all the profits of 
when the uh, farm, farm uh, Mormon Island was sold. Wow. And uh, as a result, he was disfellowshipped from the church. <laughs> yes, he was. But the church also didn't really serve him anymore, so he was probably generally okay with that, oh, based yeah, on what definitely. I know about this man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, but it was great embarrassment to his wife and his four children. Yeah. Uh, they were not happy about being uh, disfellowshipped with uh, Sam. Uh, but they were the family, so they went back to San Francisco, and that's where he established the California Star, is one of the first um, California newspapers. 29-year-old establishes one of the first newspapers in California. 29-year-old right. Sam Brannon, remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, well, he was very ambitious. And, uh, you know, obviously you might say he's an opportunist because you this might. is an interesting little fact that was not in the article. Unfortunately, I couldn't put it in. Not enough space. But... He got word of the discovery of gold. Yeah. And he withheld that information. He delayed it up for, I think it was a day, you know, before putting in print. So that way he could go around and buy up all the supplies miners would need to go up to the mother load and do, um, you know, gold panning and mining and that sort of thing. It was finally published in his paper on May 11th, 1848. Yeah, supposedly he was he was buying picks and shovels for somewhere around twenty or thirty cents a piece, and when he got mm -hmm. to the gold fields, he was selling them for twenty dollars or more for each. Exactly. Yeah, and he earned like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I think, in his first year doing that. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then you know he also did have a lot of real estate businesses, and when he was in the Sacramento area, he had other businesses, a whole long list, and then he also gave private loans at twelve percent interest. To gold miners or just people in general? People in general. Okay. Yeah. And so he was doing private banking at 12%, which is quite high for that time. Yeah. Yes. And uh, you have to remember people were earning cents per hour, not dollars per hour. Oh, no. Uh, this was, this which was is a big difference. So. A huge money he was making. You could buy those shovels originally for 20 cents. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. And the, and the he market. Was actually, it, nah, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, the markup was incredible. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an understatement, yes. <laughs> and, uh, well, he, as I said, he was an opportunist. He saw, um, it's just like joining the Mormon church so he could print their newspaper. Right now, publish. if he was alive today, I'd know where I could buy toilet paper, probably. Probably. <laughs> and hand sanitizer. And hand sanitizer. <laughs> So he and any number of things. Yes, he yeah. convenient. I mean, he just remarkably keeps finding himself at the center of the action. You talk about how mm -hmm. he announced the discovery of gold and how he, how he sat on it for a day. Um, I believe, if I understand correctly, that he is the one who announced the discovery of gold to the world. I mean, that was his newspaper that made that announcement. Exactly. And mm -hmm. having a newspaper provided him access to a lot of rich people, and uh, I would imagine that he probably found people to give those loans to through the connections he made through that newspaper. Uh, that, that would be a very good assumption. And also, you know, opportunities to invest in real estate, in businesses, that sort of thing. You know, he would get word of it even before it was in print. So he would take advantage of that opportunity and you know, buy that piece of property or invest in it or invest in a business um, or offer a loan to someone who wanted to start a business. So he was, um, he had a keen uh, business sense to the point where he was an opportunist. Yeah. And uh, people didn't necessarily like his ways of uh, conducting business, yeah. but they liked being in his company because he was a mover and shaker. Yeah, he And was. in fact, he was one of California's first millionaires. It, it's, I, yeah, is he the first or is he I one of the he, first? I think he was the first. Yeah. I mean, if he wasn't the first, he'd be like the second or third. Yeah. Um, there were, there's some discrepancy in information, so I, I don't like to say ah. absolutely he was yeah. the first, uh, but he was definitely one of the first. Yeah. So. so we are right on the cusp of him finding the land that is now Calistoga um, mm -hmm. and, and doing what he does. But before we get into that, you, you know, you mentioned that his wife and children were not very happy with being excommunicated from the church, but I don't get the sense that he really cared one way or the other about stuff like that. 
And my and I, I don't know if you have any information on this, but do we know anything about his relationship with his children? If his children were a part of his businesses, I mean, I know that he had a <laughs> a bad situation with his wife later in life, yeah. but uh, do we know anything about like his familial relationships before we get to the Calistoga part? Well, um, eventually, his children severed ties with him. Yeah. Um, I would say that there was not a very good um, home life or family life. Uh, mm-hmm. He was all about business. Um, he did have a family, uh, but they were probably secondary to everything else. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you want me to jump forward as far as some of the other difficulties he had eventually. No, we'll get to that. Let's uh, let's celebrate the man's glory and talk about uh, the town okay. that we, we love so much before we get to the end days of, of Mr. Brandon. Um, right. But here we go. Uh, he's in San Francisco, and he somehow finds his way to Napa County. How did he find his way up there? Well, he had always had the vision of recreating Saratoga Springs at, you know, in New York, which is a celebrated uh, resort town, and he just fell in love with it. And he heard about the hot springs in Calistoga, or that it was known as Agua Caliente, uh, you know, hot water or water hot. And it was also known as Hot Springs Township, uh, once it was anglicized. And he heard about the springs, so he decided to investigate, explore. So he came up, take a, you know, took a look, and saw the potential for a resort. You know, it would be a um, Sarasota Springs or Saratoga Springs of the Pacific or of California. And... Um, you know, he started doing investigating as far as uh, who owned the land and how much he could purchase it for, that sort of thing. And if you want me to go forward, um, in the year it was the year 1859 when he uh, purchased 2,000 acres of hot springs land. This number is 2,000 acres, and it was for $37,000. Yeah. Can, can you imagine what it would go for now? Oh, yeah. So at that time, he was about 40 years old. He was born in 1819, so that would make him about 40 uh, when he decided to, had the opportunity to uh, realize his dream of a, um, a resort um, equivalent to the one in New York on the uh, West Coast. So anyway, within the first year, he um, had the hotel, it was the Calistoga Hot Springs Hotel, uh, built. It was in grand style. You have to remember this is a Victorian era. Yes. Or close to it. So it was very grand in scale and in size. And uh, also in decoration and appointments. And uh, he had a, a big party to celebrate. He was quite the partier. They had like 3,000 people show up. Was that correct? Uh, yes. That was actually when the resort opened, which was a few years later. Okay. Got it. And uh, the resort opened in 1862. And he held a three-day, uh, 24-7 party. Okay. And there were the 3,000 guests. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so a few things. 1859, he buys the property for what was then 37000 uh, Today, that would be 1150000 But still I think cheap. Even more uh, striking is that the uh, building of this establishment, Calisica Hot Springs, in, well, let's say, 1860, right? Uh, right. it, it was five hundred thousand dollars in money back then. To build it, and that money today would be fifteen million five hundred thousand. Wow. Just, just okay. to give you a, I mean, it's it's obviously not a one to one, but I mean, just incredible vast sums of money. Oh yeah, oh, definitely. And you know, at this resort, I mean, there was the Grand Hotel, but the resort included guest cottages, a racetrack, and stables. And the horses uh, that were in those stables belonged to Mark Hopkins. Um, I've forgotten Mr. Lick's first name, but, you know, like the Lick Observatory. Yes. Uh, Leland Stanford. Uh, you go on and on and on. All these movers and shakers. You the, know, they had the Hearsts. Horses. My God, the Hearsts were there. And um, then there were bathing pavilions. You know, take advantage of the hot springs. And there were, um, there was a roller skating rank there. Um, you know, all sorts of things. There were dining halls. It was, uh, there was a conservatory. So there was plenty to keep people amused. Was, um, was, he, the, was he resented by the local residents for this? 
because I got to say that I got to think that this probably dramatically changed what what Calistoga looked like before uh, before he it got felt there. Like, yeah. Well, I would say for the most part, no, because it was progress, and at that time, um, new construction, especially large construction like this, would have been applauded and welcomed because it meant growth, it meant jobs, uh, it meant um, more people coming into the area and establishing the area. It meant having their own roller skating rink. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. It meant jobs. Um, You know, it's it's akin to a new development now, but in the fact that it does bring in jobs, but it's different. Um, The attitude is different. And then, of course, th- this is all uh, supposedly where the town gets its name because a, a drunken Brandon was purported to have said, I'm going to make this the Calistoga of Sarafornia. But what he meant to say was he was going to make it the Saratoga of California. And, yeah. um, Which is hard to say when you're sober. For- I, exactly. <laughs> I, if, you, if you offered me $1,000 to say that quote properly, yeah. I don't think that I could get it. I have to have it right in front of me. But in any event, uh, this stuck, and this is now what the town is called. And also, uh, it influenced the name of that great little diner um, down on the main drag, Cafe Serifornia. Yeah. Which which has that quote on their back wall, might I add? Uh, of course, I'm sure they do. And I mean, there are there are other um, legends and theories about how the name came to be, but everyone embraces the one where he was, as they said in the day, in his cups. In his cups. Yeah. That was the term for someone being drunk, uh, inebriated, whatever you want to say. Uh, he was in his cups. Here's a great thing about him is so he does this and for some people this would this would be it that you do it you you basically probably live at your resort now for the rest of your life and you're done. Mm-hmm. Instead, he decides to go into the railroad business. Well, but yeah. I think that was that was a business decision as well to try and get uh, easier transportation up to Calistoga. The object was people would take the boat from San Francisco uh, to somewhere near Vallejo and then there needed to be a way to get them from that area. Uh, up past uh, Napa and all the way up to Calistoga. But this, I think, was this kind of the beginning of the end of, of, uh, of Brannon's luck? Uh, was this railroad was maybe his first failure in business? Well, it was, yeah, it was a challenge. He had a lot of other people uh, that were part of this whole um, project. And it wasn't just Brannon, but there was, as I mentioned, Leland Stanford. There yeah. were a number of local movers, movers and shakers. Uh, that had money as well, you know, that were living here in Napa County, they all wanted the the railroad because it would be easier access for not only people but goods as well. Yeah. Uh, They saw it as a real plus. There was quite a political battle over getting the money, uh, the the bond issue basically, uh, to pass with the voters, but they did. That was big money. It was... uh Two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, or, or, or around yeah. that area, and that's in those days. That was that was a ton of money as well. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And you know, actually, um, just as a point of clarification, the uh, the steamer system, the steamships, yeah, they came to Napa, so people would disembark in Napa, okay, and then uh, they would usually, you know, before the train, they would take a um, stagecoach yeah. or a wagon, you know, and they would go uh, by roadway. And, you know, if the weather was not the best, then it would have been a very uncomfortable ride. Absolutely. Uh, from Napa to Calistoga, and it took quite a while. It was definitely not a day trip. But regarding the railroad, um, the, they started in 1864, and its maiden trip, if you will, and this is the Napa Valley Railroad Company, it was from the town of Soskal, which was uh, located about where... Uh, it's the Butler Bridge or the Southern Crossing Bridge, if you're yeah. familiar with that. Yep, the big. But it big was at the base of that um, bridge. That's where the town was located, and it went from there to Napa, and that was in 1865. Yeah, very, then, very quick, uh, very quick. One year, right? Oh yeah, and then they, it continued to progress northward, uh, and it was not only the train; they also um, put up telegraph lines. So not only was it, oh, uh, commu- right. I mean, transportation, it was also communication lines. By August of 18, uh, 1868, excuse me, uh, it reached Calistoga. Wow. So people could travel by train, which was far more comfortable. 
and, and faster. Yeah, much faster. And they could also send a telegraph. That was the cutting edge um, communication technology at the time. That would be like using the, uh, using the Internet to uh, uh, book your rooms. Also, you know, like with the telegraph, you know, that he had a lot of uh, wealthy businessmen that would come to the resort. Yeah. And they wanted a much uh, quicker way to communicate with their offices, like in San Francisco or Oakland. And the telegraph was the quickest way to send a message uh, or to respond to a message. And he wanted it to be as um, a comfortable uh, stay at his resort as possible for his wealthy uh, customers. So, Rebecca, in your profile of Brandon, I think you wrote it in 2011, uh, you call him a pioneer and a dreamer and a scoundrel. Yes. And um, to Tom's point, it does feel like, at least as far as you know, the history that's written about him, the railroad was kind of the last high business point. It seems like a lot of what you see after the railroad is uh, just kind of <laughs> one difficult position after another. Um, so, Rebecca, tell us a little bit about the, the Merino sheep that he had, which uh, caused him uh, caused him uh, a dispute with some of his neighbors. Well, uh, Brannon had a, a, a very arrogant attitude that his sheep could roam freely. He didn't have to have any regard for his neighbors or what they wanted. And, um, you know, sheep are, are well known for the fact that they, uh, when they graze, they graze down to the nub of the plant, which usually kills off the plant. And um, that... In fact, that was one of the catalysts for the, um, the Great Range Wars between the cattlemen and the sheep people uh, because of that whole feed issue. But back to Brandon, um, you know, he had his prized merino sheep, and um, he woke up one morning in the year of 1867, and all of his disgruntled neighbors had killed his sheep off. And there was a lawsuit and it really didn't resolve it. In fact, it made it worse. It aggravated everybody uh, to the point where it got, you know, uh, very contentious. He lost uh, the lawsuit, he, though, didn't he? Or did seem me he, he ended lost, up having he had to pay money for this this whole incident, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes. And because you know they the the uh, his neighbors came at him about uh, you know the the damage to their property and uh, livelihood and. That was found in their favor versus his, so, even though they took very extreme measures. That storyline gets resolved, but then well, he makes a trip over to see Andy Snyder. Yes. Well, yeah, this was this was a dispute over a mill, and mm-hmm. and uh, the ownership of the mill. Yeah. And I guess did did Brandon own the receivership of that, or how did that go? Uh, well, Brandon was the owner, and Andy owed him back, um, you know, like rent or. Uh, mortgage payments, yeah. and uh, Brandon, with I think he was accompanied by a few people, yeah. uh, came uh, to. Uh, they said it was fueled by, um, you know, this this tension that had been growing, and then also alcohol, yeah, which always makes things worse in yeah. situations like yes, that. Yes, it does. And uh, so there was a face-off, and. Um, Andy Snyder ended up shooting Brannon, and uh, it, they were very serious um, injuries. Yeah. In fact, at one point, they thought that Brannon was going to die because of those injuries. And actually, um, Snyder was really not the nicest of persons because he um, actually shot Brannon as Brannon was running away. Wow. Okay, that's not uh, in your article, I yeah, don't think. Yeah, that is not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. <laughs> well, that's part of the story, uh, and it's, it's true, where yeah. uh, Brandon knew what was going on. He had been shot, and then he turned to run, yeah. and he was shot again. And he oh. was shot in the hip and near the spine. Yeah, and, and, and there yeah. he had some permanent paralysis from that, as I recall. Exactly, yeah. yes. And, you know, while they were anticipating that Brandon was going to be dying from these, um, you know, gunshot wounds, the register, uh, the Napa register, yeah. wrote this really nice, um, you know, uh, celebratory piece about Brandon and then all that he has done, and which was true at the time, I mean, yeah. this is, um, you know, the late 1860s, where he said that, um, or the paper said, 
Brannon has done more for Napa County than any other two men. And then it went on to say more, and they wanted to recognize and appreciate all that he has done. And it was a case of, I mean, to summarize what they were saying, uh, you don't know what you have until it's gone. Yeah. And that was basically what they were saying about Brandon. And we're going to lose him, and we're going to lose all of his vision and his ambition and his drive and all the things that he does and that he's done. Uh, but he did survive uh, those, uh, those wounds that were uh, caused by you know, Snyder shooting him. And so and, and, this okay. all ended up in court, correct? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, and I mean, he, he, he may have, after surviving, sort of wished that he had not survived based on what was to come. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, yeah. he lived such like a a, a, a vision filled, uh, wealth filled, uh, dynamic life, yeah. and it just seems after he recovered, uh, p- partially paralyzed, um, yeah. it, a lot of uh, not great personal things sort of uh, highlight the last years of his life. Yeah, but you know what? For all the research that I've done about this particular incident, the one thing I can't find out is what uh, how the the court case was disposed. Uh, Andy Snyder was was arrested and jailed and went to court for attempted murder. And how did that turn out? Well, he was found guilty. He was. And did they lock him up, or what did they do with him? Well, he was put in jail. He would be a county jail. For, do we know how long? Because I'm amazed at how short, uh, short-lived short a lot of those sentences were. Did, did Do we know anything else of what, uh, where Andy Snyder ended up? How long he was in jail for, or anything like that? I don't know his, his sentence. Um... But he did return to Calistoga. Ah, great. So, he, he um, af- after it was all, all said and done. Yeah. So, um, and you know, Brandon, probably, the way it might have worked out is the Brandon's exit from Calistoga, I'm getting a little ahead, and his return, Snyder's return, uh, might have um, Co- happened at coincided. an time. Yeah. 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 Wow. As one left, one came back, kind of thing. So, uh, and as far as Brandon's personal life, um, yeah, I kind of hinted at this. Um, he was not the best family man, and he was definitely not the best husband. He, uh, he, he loved the beautiful women, folks. Yeah. He couldn't yeah, get enough yeah. of the beautiful women. Yeah, that's that's exactly. his story, and yeah. he had a very, very inf- infamous uh, affair with a dancer by the name of Lola Montez. <laughs> yes. And that was kind of like the last straw for the wife, um, Anna Eliza, Anna Eliza. And she was granted a divorce in 1870. I mean, this is, that was very uncommon at yeah. that time. I, so you know what, granted. as I read about this, I was surprised because she was awarded uh, quite an award. She, uh, the alimony w- w- was quite high. Mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. felt like well, it was al- almost a, ho- a Hollywood-style divorce. Yeah, well, it was community property even back then, I guess. But uh, she was awarded half of his financial assets and real estate and all of that. Well, and Brandon, didn't he have property on Hawaii? He had a lot of property in California. I mean, this was an extremely wealthy man. Um, Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. At least at that time he was, yeah. That was a that was a problem for him, um, mm-hmm. big problem for him. And then uh, in 1873, he leases the resort to George Schoenwald. Um, yeah. Why why did he do that? Well, he was losing money, and uh, he was no longer able to operate because you know um, Anna received half of his uh, um, his estate, basically his yeah. his uh, finances, and uh, some of his other real estate things. You know. His notes were becoming due on all of the loans he had taken for the resort and for other uh, projects he had. And he didn't have the money. He was, you know, what's the saying? Um, paper rich, cash poor, or however yeah. that goes. Yeah. He had a lot of wealth on paper, yeah. but he didn't have real wealth. You know, he didn't have much in the bank, so to speak. Yeah. And so he had to, you know, start... Um, turning some of these things around so he could start covering his debt. And then... And um, that's why he leased yeah. the resort in 1873. And then two years later, he has to sell it. Right. Yeah. And the person that bought it, one of the people that bought uh, a portion of the uh, resort was Leland Stanford. Ah. And uh, it, there, there is a kind of a 
folklore in Napa County that Stanford was looking at Calistoga as a potential site for his university. That would have been convenient. Um, it would have been very inconvenient to be in Calistoga. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was so far away from the, um, you know, the, the main portion of the Bay Area. Yeah. And so, you know, that was really not an option, and eventually Stanford sold the property. And now, is, that, is there any documentation of that at all, or is it just sort of lore that's been passed down over the years? His ownership or the thought that it'd be a, a campus? The thought that it'd be a campus. That's more um, lore, if you will. Yeah. It hasn't been substantiated anywhere. Okay. As far as I can tell. But it's it's kind of a fun little uh, piece of local lore. Yeah. So just like the, the mustard and the yeah. uh, and all of that. So So Brandon leaves the area sometime after that and uh, you know, tries to do what he did so many times before, which is have another act, you know. Uh, right. he wants some uh, reinvention he wants people to look at him as a successful guy because certainly the last five years have not been kind to him unfortunately he never really got that and then um, you know uh, some years later he passes away and uh, he is buried in San Diego, California yeah yes, yes. Yeah. and one uh, interesting note I know it's not in the article uh, once again it's you know space constraints yeah. uh, the, the Mexican government owed him money yes and um, he was able to uh, be awarded that money. I think it was like forty nine thousand so dollars or something like somewhere in that area. Right. I mean, yeah. it, it was considerable sum. Yeah. So he was able to pay off his debt before he died, and which was very seemed to be very important to him. Yeah, and then and, he ended but he up. But he didn't have yeah. much left when he died, though. I think he he had maybe was it a palmetto uh, orchard or something like that down in the San Diego area. <laughs> Yes, yes. Palmettos or almonds, <laughs> and that was yeah, that was his was. final curtain. Mm-hmm. And he died in. Uh, let's well, give the exact date. It's May sixth, um, eighteen eighty nine, and he was about seventy years oh, old. Yeah. Since he had no uh, relationship with his children, it was his nephew that took care of his burial, and also um, had the the headstone that you referred to earlier um, created. You know. I, um, Sam Brannon, 1819, 1889, California pioneer of 46, and that's 1846, dreamer, leader, and empire builder. Wow. So, so yeah. how long did the resort, was this, what, what did, was the resort ever really successful? Um, it had a brief heyday. Yeah. Um, actually, it, it had a, a fairly decent run. You have to remember it opened in what, uh, well, the hotel in 1860. Yeah. Uh, but then the resort in 1862. So it had about a decade of, um, you know, uh, functioning and being profitable. Cool. But he had, Brandon had so much debt that it wasn't profitable enough to cover those notes that he had. Yeah. And to pay off his investors and that sort of thing, his partners. And then after he sold it, was it was it successful for, for quite a while after that, or how did that go? You know, it was leased for two years, and then it was sold yeah. uh, in 1875. And there was, it kind of went along. Um, it was not overly successful, yeah. but it actually opened the door for other resorts in Calistoga ah. on a much smaller scale. Yeah. So the uh, the so, mineral baths and the mud baths and and all those things. So so, a little more boutique-ish. A, a little more uh, practical. Yeah. <laughs> Not a grand resort, you know, something that you could uh, actually make a success. So. It feels almost like a crime that he's not buried in Calistoga. <laughs> I mean, yes. it, it, although it might have... Might have been a dangerous place to locate his, his uh, grave. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure his grave would have been defaced now and then, but yeah. I mean, it just feels so appropriate that he would be yeah. there as his final resting place, but um, that's the way it turned out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I mean, there are many people that, um, you know, early pioneers, where they made a substantial impact on some community, and then for whatever reason, they leave that area yeah. and... and Oftentimes because there's a, a turnaround in their fortune um, yeah. or, or something along those lines. And they end up being buried elsewhere. 
Yeah. That they have no real historical connection, other than their their final days were lived there. No, oh, yeah, he's he's got a grave in San Francisco and, and a street, or I mean, a, a street in San Francisco and a grave in San Diego, and mm-hmm. that kind of is is it. Although there's a Brandon Street also in Calistoga, as I recall. Yes, yeah. there is. Okay. And Who? There there was a restaurant too, but I think they recently closed. Oh. Probably, if you did a, a search, you could find other Brandon. Uh, maybe like in the Sacramento Delta area. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Who do you he think... A, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, he has such a fascinating life. Yeah. Um, if that was enough material <laughs> for a small article. Yeah, absolutely. I bring up his final resting place because I'm curious, who do you think the most historically significant person that's buried in Calistoga is? Most historically significant person in Calistoga. I read someone's opinion on this, which I'd love to share. Um, it okay, is sure. a cemetery enthusiast who has a blog online named Lauren Rhodes. And okay. her opinion is that the most historically important person is buried in the Pioneer Cemetery. And his name is Eli Philpot, And he was a stagecoach driver who was killed in 1881 during the Benson stage robbery. His murder... Okay was one of the events which precipitated the gunfight at the OK Corral in Tombstone, Arizona. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. I'm just hearing about this. I wish I had the background. How did how did that become connected to the gunfight at the OK Corral? Well, obviously, his, his murder was a problem, and um, I would assume the wow. gunfight had to do with that. And I, wow. then I guess they probably trucked him back to Calistoga to bury him. Wow. Oh, he oh, was... Goodness. He was killed. Well, you know, in, it's, it's okay. interesting all these different ties. If you don't mind me just leaping into no, this. No, go ahead. Yeah. You know, I had mentioned Leland Stanford before. You know, in, in association with Brandon, and you know, obviously they were contemporaries. They were friends. They were uh, business associates. And um, you know, I talked about the momentary thought of having his university there, which was you know, that's not going to work. But Stanford was, um, as probably could notice, when I was talking about his horses being boarded at the resort, he was a fancier of a horse, of horse flesh, you know, races, that sort of thing, uh, thoroughbreds. And he got into a debate with another gentleman, and I, I apologize, I, oh, I don't yes. remember the other guy's name, uh, but he was also another mover and shaker in the state of California. They had a, a gentleman's wager regarding horses and when they're running, you know, at yes. full speed. And the question was, when they're running, are the horse's hooves off the ground, all four at the same time? Yeah. This is a great little story. This you is, shared yeah. this with me on the phone earlier. Yeah, and Stanford said, yes, all four hooves are off the ground at one time. The other gentleman said, no, that's not possible. And so um, Stanford knew a uh, English photographer by the name of Edward Mybridge. And uh, I'll tell his story in a few minutes. But Edward uh, Mybridge had developed a um, technique of taking uh, a series of photographs. Sequential photography. Yeah, it was like in motion. Yeah. So he um, set up his cameras so he could photograph a horse running. And he proved Stanford was correct. That at certain times in their stride, all four hooves are off the ground when a horse is running. And you can actually, those pictures are, 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 are easily to see. And they're yeah. kind of beautiful to look at. Well, what a hilarious thing to think about the, uh, the person that Stanford University is named after. Just sitting around with his friends being like, you know that horse over there that's running? I have a bet for you, sir. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's it's just a hilarious little anecdote. Um, Stanford being one of the most prestigious universities in the entire world. Um, this this story is so quaint and beautiful. It just it's so fun. It is. It's very human, you know. Um, which is it's always fun to do these these kinds of stories. Uh, I, it's not to tear down the mystique. It's just to show that they're human. Yeah. Um, and I talked about Edward Mybridge, and he was from England. His name was originally Eddie Muggeridge. Um, and after he had an accident, he was on a stagecoach in England, and he was riding, he was on the, the top, uh, you know, where you usually have the baggage. And uh, they hit a, a, a rut or a bump in the road, and he fell out and landed on his head. 
and had a serious head injury. And when he recovered, he, his personality had changed substantially. And he decided to change his name to Edward Lybridge. And Edward is spelled very differently. It's E-D-W-E-A-R-D. Well, yeah, because there, there's a second part to the uh, Edward uh, Mybridge story, as I recall. Oh, yes, definitely. And well, is that... he, is, he is known as the father of motion pictures. Yes. Uh, you know, he had that, uh, developed that technique of taking um, photographs. So, And these are glass plates. Uh, they're not the negatives that we would know from just a few years ago. Uh, the negatives were on glass plates. But he would take those, and he created a projector, and hopefully I'm saying this right, zopraxscope, zopraxiscope. But anyway, what he would, he did is he put the the glass slides um, in this carousel, basically, and there was a candle in the middle, and it was basically he would just turn the carousel, and it would create a sense of motion, and the first one that he showed was in San Francisco of a horse moving. And it was on a very cold day, and you could see the, the steam rising from uh, the horse's nostrils, and it's shaking its head, that sort of thing. So it was the first motion picture, or pictures in motion. There's obviously a, a reason we're bringing him up now, uh, beyond just the horse thing, which we'll get to in a moment. But I would like to say, if you're listening to this and you're near a computer, Google this man's name. Just look at the man's beard. Later in life, the, he had just an incredible beard. The envy <laughs> of, of most men who have beards. <laughs> Unfortunately for Ed Weird, uh, we are not just talking about him because of the bet that uh, Leland Stanford made. There is another part to his story, which yeah. I believe um, has something to do with Santa Rosa and Calistoga. Yes, it does. Um, Edward uh, Mybridge lived in San Francisco. And he was, uh, he, photo, he was a photographer all over the state of California. And uh, he married a much younger woman. Her name was Flora. And when he was away on these um, photographic uh, projects, he asked a gentleman by the name of Major um, Harry Larkins to be her escort. <laughs> well, he ended up being more than her escort. Uh, they had an affair, and a child resulted from that um, affair, a son. And uh, Edward thought that was his son until the housekeeper, who was very upset with Mybridge for not paying her on time, uh, let him know that that child was not his. Oof. And um, then it, the story continued to evolve, and he found out more about Larkins, and he found out that Larkins had moved to a, um, a mine in Knights Valley, west of Calistoga, yeah. called the Yellow Jacket Mining Camp or Company. And so uh, Mybridge uh, made his way from San Francisco to Calistoga, and from there he hired a wagon uh, he obviously had to spend the night because it was a long, long day's journey yeah. to uh, Calistoga from San Francisco in those days. And this is 1874. You should have taken the train. Uh, then he uh, took a wagon later in the day up to the Yellow Jacket Mine, and it had been a dark, stormy night, and he knocked on the uh, manager's door where Larkin was staying, and he called out, he says, um, are you Harry Larkins? And uh, Larkins said, could you step into the light, sir? I can't see you. And which he did, Mybridge did, and he shot and killed Larkins. Yeah. Edward Mybridge calmly walks over Larkins' body and into the manager's home oh. and sat down at the uh, dining table, picked up the newspaper and started reading. <laughs> And uh, the manager of the camp uh, arrested him, called the authorities, and the women of the household were um, fainting left and right yeah. because someone had been murdered in their home. Yeah. Um, Larkin's body was put into a wagon, and uh, as was Mybridge, and 
they were taken down to Calistoga, and Larkin's remains were taken to the coroner's office in Napa, and my bridge was taken to the jail, the Napa County Jail. Yeah. And he was put on trial. It was fairly brief. I mean, it was drawing all sorts of attention. There were people coming in for all over, all over the place because it was such a sensational story. And in the process, um, Mybridge was divorcing his wife, Flora, at that time. Anyway, um, the trial was ended and, you know, the, the arguments, that sort of thing. The jury went in and delivered uh, for about, I do believe it was 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah. And found him not guilty. It was justifiable homicide justifiable. because he had the right to protect his marriage bed. Yeah, he did, and also he was he was also trying for the insanity plea uh, based on yeah. his 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 head injury uh, from the mm-hmm. uh, the uh, wagon a- accident. Could be the stagecoach accident. I, yeah, he had several uh, several uh, friends of his come and, and testify that prior that he was such a changed man after the stagecoach accident that uh, that this was what a lot of people believed was the reason that he would do such a thing. But in the yeah. end, it was really justifiable, justifiable homicide. I would assume that the, the uh, jury was probably all men. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In 1874, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And poor, Harry, old man. poor Harry Larkins, if you Google him nowadays, uh, the first thing that comes up is a book called The Scoundrel Harry Larkins and His Pitiless Killing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, um, oh. yeah, I guess that's, that's the legacy that he well, leaves behind. That's no fun. But yeah, Calistoga is a supporting cast uh, player in that story. <laughs> yeah, that story. Um, but what a remarkable little overlap that is. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to kind of finish the story, uh, Flora ended up dying from the flu oh. um, a, a few years, a couple of years later. And since it was never um, changed as far as parental guardianship, yeah. Um, Mybridge Edward Mybridge uh, became the uh, the guardian of the little boy yeah. who he placed in uh, apprenticeship with a blacksmith. And, and what became of the little of that, of that child, no one knows. I, I think it would be good to talk a little bit, as long as we're really hitting the uh, the big characters now, but it's a little more rapid fire now that Brandon's out of the way. Yeah. Edward Turner Bale, the doctor uh, Edward Turner Bale. Going back yeah. in history and connecting with Edward Turner Bale uh, connects with uh, Petaluma. To some degree, one of my good friends uh, was a relative of his, and oh. it connects to Thomas Larkin in San Francisco. Larkin Street is named Larkin after him. Larkin Street, weirdly enough. Do you, <laughs> do you want to start with with uh, Edward Bale? This guy is is a, is a piece. There's no. Well, well, tell us what you found out in the last couple of weeks. What uh, for Edward Bale? Yeah. Well, so Edward Bale was uh, was a Brit who was a British doctor, maybe. Uh, there was some question as to whether or not he came freely from, he left Britain freely or if he was escaping debtor's prison. Oh, can I say one thing too? Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that if, if you're in Calistoga today, I, I think the legacy that he leaves uh, behind most notably is the grist mill. The grist mill in Calistoga, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. 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 So he, he leaves Britain and uh, gets on the boat, uh, it's called the Harriet, and uh, it, he finds himself on this boat. He's the doctor of the boat. Uh, there's still some question as to whether or not he truly had a, a, a license to be a doctor, but that's what he claimed he was. So there he was, a doctor on the boat. Uh, he ends up uh, sw- swimming ashore to Monterey, claiming, oh, wow. that, <laughs> claiming that the Harriet uh, had run aground, uh, but there was never any story about as to whether or not the Harriet truly ran aground. There's still some question as to whether that happened or whether he was asked to leave the boat <laughs> several miles off of the coast of, of uh, California and had to swim, and he, he survived at any rate, and swam to Monterey, where he uh, he showed up in Monterey just at the same time that their doctor, the doctor in Monterey, who, who had fallen out of favor because he had tried to, uh, he'd, try, he'd been involved with a revolt against the governor at the time, Alvarado. And so... Uh, it turns out uh, Edward Bale is able to come in, say that he's a doctor, and take over as the local doctor in Monterey. <laughs> and uh, with some amount of success, he ended up marrying uh, into falling in love with, well, or I, I don't know if he fell in love with, but he married Maria Ignacio Sobranis. 
and this is the Petaluma connection. Uh, Mary Ignacio Sobranis was a niece of General Vallejo, which set Bale up for uh, just a ton of, of uh, wonderful opportunity. But at the same time, uh, Maria Ignacio Sobranis uh, is the great, great aunt of Bill Sobranis, who was a good friend of mine and a, a, a writer for the Petaluma Argus Courier and one of Petaluma's most notable uh, characters and, and uh, uh, peoples, I think. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is where... And so while he was still part of that, he ended up uh, uh, moving to San Francisco, setting up an office in the home of Thomas Larkin, uh, where he f- ran afoul of uh, uh, Thomas Larkin's wife. She called the police on him and had him arrested for selling alcohol out of his office and dosing his... Uh, patients with uh, too high a dosage of whatever drugs he was prescribing to them. So he spent time in jail in San Francisco because of that. And so there's the Larkin connection, I guess. And so he's not in Calistoga yet, but this is a very similar sort of trajectory to Brandon. You know, this guy who's from way far away, he does a little time here, he does a little time there. But then Calistoga is where he ultimately really leaves his mark. Right, well, you know, as as a result of the marriage uh, with Maria... Uh, as you mentioned, he was eligible for all sorts of wonderful things, including the land grant. Yeah. And uh, the land grant he received uh, is it, it's along the, the western hills from about St. Helena to um, just south of Calistoga. And that's about where the, uh, that is where the grist mill is located. And um, also, the, actually, the property re- reached... Um, beyond uh, south of St. Helena. That's where their home was. He was a very unique character. Yeah. Uh, He seemed to have a real issue with his temper. Yeah. And kind of um, outbursts that would get him into trouble. And one story goes that, um, you know, one of her uncles was also Salvador Vallejo. That would be Mariano's brother. Yeah. And, um, Supposedly, Edward Turner uh, Bale found them embracing inappropriately, his wife and uncle. Wow. And uh, that just set a whole series of things off, such as um, Bale trying to shoot uh, Salvador in Sonoma. Wow. And uh, he could have been executed for that. But he was uh, flogged instead. Um, or whipped. Correct. That um, was that was the supposed duel. I when I read that art that story, it was about a, it was actually a, a duel between the two of them. But yeah, it, and then there's the story about a duel. Yeah. And oh. um, there's a couple of different stories, but he would they, they based on what I've found, he had a lot of trouble getting uh, along with his in laws. Uh, well, but he seems he to be getting along with most everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> well, which so, is interesting because you could argue that the only reason he had the position that he had in Calistoga was because of the family he married into, right? I mean, exactly. the wealth and influence that he got from that marriage is what allowed him to basically be someone we're talking about well, here today. That's how he was mm-hmm. awarded the land grant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just mean, it's it's funny that he couldn't... Uh, keep it together the one thing he needed to do was not yeah. not be getting into trouble with his uncle and his play, in-laws play nice right right <laughs> exactly and um as far as the the grist mill uh that was started in um the late 1840s yeah and uh it, it went through various uh, modifications over time yeah but actually when the news of the gold rush uh reached napa county you know the bay area uh, Bale was one of the ones that went up to yes. the uh, mother load. To mine to, for gold. To, yep. Yeah, to go mining for gold. And um, he came back, he was quite ill. Yeah. And he passed in uh, about a year later, I think it was 1849. Yeah. I think that's when he passed away. And uh, so Maria uh, hired people to help her with the mill, and eventually they, she sold it. Yeah. And yeah. went through a succession of owners. Um, but it was always known as the, the Bale Grist Mill. Yeah. And that's his legacy as far as the history of Napa County. But he was, you know, he would fight with his um, his workers, and it always had to do with money. 
Yeah, of and um, there are stories about shootouts at the mill um, because the workers wanted their money and he wasn't ready to pay them or some issue. Um, he had quite the temper. How central was that mill to the industry, to the area? I mean, right now it's sort of like a thing you drive by and you're like, ah, there's that thing that I don't really know, but there it is, if you're kind of an out-of-towner yeah. like me. But, I mean, I have right. to imagine that that building at an earlier time was a very important part of the infrastructure. Oh, grist mills were incredibly important. I mean, you have to remember that California was very young and there, were, there was a great influx of people and they need, all needed to eat. They needed food. And Napa County and Sonoma County were uh, a great food supplier for a large percentage of those that lived in the Bay Area and in the Motherload. Uh, Napa County was considered a breadbasket because we had a lot of dry crop, such as wheat and barley. Yeah. And that needed to be processed into flour so you could make bread. And uh, those grist mills were very important. George Yaunt had one. That was the first one that yeah. was built here. And then uh, Bale. And then there was one up in Childs Valley, Joseph Childs. Let's talk about George Yaunt then, because he was someone else who Tom came across. And yeah. um, he's got a great obviously story. he's got a story and he's yeah. got a town named after him. Um, mm-hmm. it, I was so struck when I read about the people that we're not going to talk about tonight, how many of them yeah. have towns named after them within That's the 100-mile radius. So, uh, right. uh, Tom, do you want to start us off with Mr. Well, Yount? Uh, George Yount was, uh, boy, his, his history goes way back. He was involved, uh, he was a soldier in the War of 1812. Uh, he was involved in the Indian Wars. Uh, he came out to California as a trapper with the Wolf Kill cr- uh, uh, crew. And... Uh, uh, he's, his story is, is just one of an adventure. Uh, the other thing that blew me away uh, was that, so you read about when he decided to be a trapper and come out to California. He left his uh, three children and his wife in Missouri. But I note uh, on the back end of the story, I think his daughters end up in Calistoga, don't they? They, they end up in Napa Valley. They end up in Napa Valley. So he actually uh, made good on that even and sent, and got his, uh, sent for his children. And they ended up out here anyway. So, uh, interesting story with Yaunt. When Yaunt died, which was 1865, I do believe, um, the town around his land grant was called Sebastopol. Yeah. <laughs> and he said he did not want the town named after him. But after he passed, they renamed the community Yauntville. And it's not Yaunt, it's Yaunt. Yaunt, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> just a correction there. Uh, but he was a really interesting person, and he did have family, as you said, family come out, uh, his daughters, and um, they reconnected with their dad. They lived here. Uh, one of their da- one of his daughters, I do believe it was his daughter, um, it, her child was the first white child born in, I think it was Yerba Buena, which would be San Francisco. Wow. Yeah, that's that's uh, noteworthy. What do we think the biggest legacy that uh, Yaunt leaves behind, aside from obviously the the city, which is named after him, was it just the grist mill? Uh, well, he was the first settler here in Napa County. He was the first land grant owner. Yeah, was he was uh, he the first non Mexican uh, land grant that was issued? He was the very first land grant owner. Period in Napa County. Uh, his, he received his land grant in I think it was May of eighteen thirty six. And uh, he was the first land grant recipient for Napa County. Wow. And it was, uh, it was a thank you from Mariano Vallejo to Yaunt for all of his assistance. Uh, and some of it was carpentry work, yeah. such as teaching them how to uh, make um, split wood shingles for their homes. Did he have a good relationship with the people that lived in the area? He thought he did anyway. In, in some of his writings, he felt that he, uh, he liked the Native Americans and uh, thought that they were industrious and, and wonderful people and that they liked him. Uh, you know, I think history might look differently at that. It, it's kind of a, a, a mixed answer. I mean, he did um, fight a, a battle against the Native Americans, um, not only um, in other portions of the United States, but also here in uh, California. Uh, but once he was settled here in Napa Valley, I think for the most part, 
Uh, he had a good relationship with the Native Americans, and he uh, welcomed everyone. Uh, he invited uh, every pioneer. In fact, he was kind of the the voice, if you will, of Napa Valley to those that were in, you know, further east, come west, and I will welcome you, and you can stay at my, my casa, and um, I will be a, a gracious host, and I will help you establish yourself here in Napa County. And that influx actually started in 1841. It was long before the Bear Flag Revolt. Yeah. What, wasn't there, isn't there like a fun fact about the California state flag in Calistoga? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, let's talk um, about that. Well, that would be uh, Peter Storm. Yes. Um, you know, there's some debate as to who actually created the flag um, and where was it originally created, that sort of thing. And this is the information that I found, um, and someone might find something different. So um, I will just you know, tell you what I found. Uh, Peter Storm, he was actually uh, a sailor from Scandinavia, and he settled here. He was part of the Bear Flag Revolt. And while the, the pioneers were debating um, when they were going to be doing the, uh, the raid on Sonoma and discussing all the details, uh, Peter Storm decided that he was going to create a flag. And it was made out of two petticoats, a white and a red, to kind of emulate the red and white stripes on the uh, American flag. And uh, then there is a grizzly bear painted on it uh, that resembles a pig more than the bear. <laughs> and there is it a really blue. Does. Yeah. There's a blue star on it, and uh, the supposedly it is in the hope that California would eventually join the Union. Uh, you know, the United States as a state. Yeah. And uh, he created, Peter Storm, the way the story goes, created the flag, and then it was raised over Sonoma when they um, they raided it. They, it was a coup, basically, a rebellion. Yeah. And to declare, declare it as um, part of the California Republic, because California was a separate republic, republic for a number of weeks before the United States decided it was going to be a territory. And then that flag was designed in Calistoga? Is that the story? Is that the That's overlap? That's the story. Yeah. That's the story. And uh, Peter Storm was residing in Calistoga with another pioneer family, the Cyrus family. Very. I'm very glad you brought that up. Please continue. Okay. And then uh, Peter Storm... Um, he basically uh, reclaimed the, the flag and uh, the one that he made, and he would uh, lead the 4th of July parade oh. with that flag on a, on a pole, and supposedly it was buried with him. when He died wow. December 14, 1877, and he was buried at Tulake Cemetery. Once again, that's here in Napa. With the flag? With the flag. Wow. Let's so uh, that's, that's the story. That's the story. Well, I'm glad you brought up the Cyruses because um, there is a fascinating connection that they are right in the middle of with Calistoga. And it intersects, weirdly, with Brannon. I'm not sure if you know the side story on that, but, but go ahead, Rebecca, and let us know. Let's, let's discuss the Cyrus family. Let's talk about how Calistoga plays into and has brief overlap with the Donner Party. Right. Okay. The, uh, the Donner Party... Um, now, most everybody knows about the, the tragedy of 1846-1847 and this whole party being trapped up in the Donner Summit. And uh, there was a uh, one family, the majority of the members survived. They were all siblings. And uh, it was, uh, I've forgotten how many, I think there were six that survived. Most of them ended up settling in the Calistoga area uh, within a few years of being rescued, if not immediately afterwards. Now, if I'm not and, mistaken, were they were rescued or they left before it really got bad? Is that correct? They were there the entire time. They were rescued. Uh, they were taken out of that area by um, a rescue group. Two of the Graves, and in the family that I'm referring to, the last name is Graves. Yeah. And uh, two of the family members, the, the father and the husband of the eldest daughter 
they were the ones that uh, tried to go out on their own to find their way out to go get help for the rest of the party. Okay. And most of them um, did not make it. Now, when they found, and, they made their way back to Sacramento to find that help. Was that correct? Yes, there were a few that did, and others were starting to hear about what was going on. Yeah. Um, there were other uh, pioneer parties that were passing through the area and said, you need to get going, you know, to the Donner Party. Uh, you need to keep moving. The weather's turning. And um, they said, no, 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 we'll be fine. And that was, of course, a big mistake. Yeah, that was. And if you don't know, uh, the Donner Party resulted in uh, cannibalism to survive. Yeah. And um, it, it is considered to be one of the most uh, spectacular tragedies in California history. So when word made it to Sacramento that there was the Donner Party was stuck and needed help, uh, in, one, in some of my research, uh, researching Sam Brannan, uh, there was a story that uh, his, uh, his employees, uh, Sam sent a crew of his employees up, and they were the first ones to reach the Donner Party. Are you familiar mm-hmm. with that part of it? Right, and there was a gentleman from uh, Napa Valley that, was, that lived in the Calistoga area. His last name was Tucker. And um, he was also one of the um, part of that team to rescue the uh, the Donner Party. Yeah. And he was responsible for bringing a lot of the the Graves yeah, family into way. Napa Valley. Yeah. You know, but a lot of them first stopped you know, after they were rescued, and, and they had to walk out. It's not like you go in with um, vehicles or that sort of thing. Yeah. Obviously, it was not. No, you got to get them out. That ability. No. So all the survivors had to be walked out. And many of them still didn't make it uh, once they got to Sutter's Fort. That's uh, where, I mean, that was the settlement you were referring to Sacramento. Yeah. Um, that would be the settlement that um, all this was uh, being coordinated from or out of. Oof. And that's where they first went was Sutter's Fort. And uh, some of them did not make it. You know, the Graves family, like I said, they were all siblings. Uh, there were eight of them when they walked out, and there were six by the time they left Sutter's Fort, because oh. uh, two of the youngest ones um, could Didn't not survive, survive their, yeah. their wounds, uh, their injuries. You know, there's things like frostbite and exposure yeah. and starvation and dehydration and who knows whatever else that they had to endure. Uh, but the Grace family... Uh, Three of them became permanent residents of the Calistoga area. There was Sarah Graves Fosdick, and her husband was the one that died, Jay Fosdick, when they were, you know, trying to find their way to help. And she married a couple more times. She actually was the first school teacher here in Napa County. And that first school building, uh, it was basically a lean-to. Uh, it was for all the children that were in the Calistoga area. And so she was the first teacher. And as a side note, that school was the second non-church-related school in the state of California. So that's kind of an interesting side yeah, note. Yeah, that is. And so they and then, they lived their life in Calistoga. And uh, I, I understand that the one of the family members just didn't speak of it at all to her family. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, Sarah never spoke of it, and neither did her one of her sisters, uh, Lovina. And Lovina married uh, John Cyrus. Okay, and then and that's that's how Cyrus comes into the picture in yeah. our story. Ex- exactly, and uh, she never spoke. They well, supposedly in 1901. Uh, the surviving family members that had been a part of the Donner Party were interviewed by a San Francisco newspaper, and they told their story of what happened. Yeah. Well, five years later was the uh, earthquake and fire in San Francisco, oh. and all records had been were destroyed. Were destroyed. So we're we're getting close to I think being done with this chapter of, of Calistoga history. Uh, unless there's anything else to talk about on the Donner side, I mean I know that there's a there's a lot of biography and and their lives that followed. But for our purposes, just the fact that you know a, a percentage of the folks that experienced that tragedy uh, played out the rest of their lives in Calistoga is, yeah. is quite remarkable. Very yeah. interesting. Uh, was, oh, definitely. There was there was Sarah Lovina and their brother, the only surviving brother, which was William. And uh, William was the uh, the blacksmith in Calistoga. 
<laughs> and uh, so he lived a, a good life in Calistoga. And then there was one other sister. She lived here for a while, and then she moved. And that was Ellen. Three little stories that I want to make sure we get in this episode before we wrap. Uh, one okay. of them, one of them is a uh, old hog killer. <laughs> So tell us a bit. You and Tom are both very familiar with Old I Hog love, Killer. I love that story. So let's let's talk about this uh, this creature, Old Hog Killer. Well, there's there's actually two. Ver- I mean, two separate stories about Old uh, Hog Killer. That's all right. So we can do them, two. One of them involves Sarah and Lavina. Oh, very I good. Don't know if you know, yeah. I don't know if this. Do you know this story, Tom? Have you heard well, it? Well, I was. I'd read about Pleasant Cyrus being the the shooter. Anyway, the the the. Uh, the trigger yeah. man on that. Ah, don't spoil it. Don't spoil well, it. I'm yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we'll, go, well the, the one about Sarah and Lovina. Uh, Sarah. So was, what year is this? I'm sorry. Just a context for the listener. Oh, uh, well, this would be um, about, I'd say the late 1840s. Yeah. Um, maybe it's about 1849 to about 1850. This is, what, this is what you've got to love about a town like Calistoga, <laughs> that here we are 150 some odd years later, and we're talking about old hog killer. <laughs> yeah. Life was simpler uh, in well, the pioneer I days. Noticed, but there's a lot of bear stories in this. Oh, <laughs> the bear flag, old yeah. hog killer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, All right, so but but, anyway, but here we are talking about old hog killer. So go ahead. Sarah was alone. Her husband had gone out um, to do, you know go hunting, which was common for the gentleman to do, and uh, it was a cabin that was very isolated. So her younger sister Lovina. Uh, came over to stay with her just to keep her company. And what they would do every night, uh, they would put away all their animals in, you know, uh, special cages and that sort of thing, uh, in enclosures to keep them safe from predators, you know, not only uh, bears, but also mountain lions and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, one little piglet found its way out of its um, enclosure. And Sarah and Lovina were in the cabin, and they heard the squealing as to what, and went to investigate to see what's going on, and here is this little piglet being chased by old hog killer. <laughs> and uh, they start going, running around the cabin, and the women are banging pots and pans, and, you know, they're trying to open the door to coax the little piglet in, and nothing works, and... Um, the women just, they give up after a while because they, they try everything. Uh, they don't want to get in, in between the bear and the piglet because that could end very badly for them. Uh, so they close the door and, um, based on the sounds that they heard, old hog killer had a little piglet dinner that night. So why, why is this story in the annals of Calistoga history, do you think? Just because it kind of paints a picture of what life was like back then? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You know, and it focuses on, uh, you know, pioneers that were living, pioneer settlers of the area, what their life was like. It was very rustic. It was very difficult. Uh, your nearest neighbor could be miles away from you. You had to be very self-sufficient. And you had to live life in um, kind of a, a very dangerous uh, place because of, wildlife and uh, what they potentially could do. Well, so, and, and so, it, so that's, in, that's in that vein, in, in that vein, uh, living in a dangerous place because of the wildlife, um, there's a story of the Elliot family, Mrs. Elliot, who actually had mm-hmm. built a tree house uh, for, yes. uh, for her children and her to live in uh, to mm-hmm. avoid, uh, in particular, um, uh, a hog killer. Mm-hmm. Does that sound right? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. This, this bear was making a lot of trouble for everybody. Well, Tom, do you want to start with the, um, the one that you wanted to talk about? So, yeah, it started with, and this is, this is according to, this is in the, uh, a book called The Early Calistoga, The Brannan Saga by Kay Archuleta. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's a fun book to read. She talks about Mrs. Elliot uh, building a treehouse so that when her husband was away hunting, uh, and they were living in a tent at the time anyway, uh, mm-hmm. she and her children could go and live in the treehouse and be safe away from uh, old, old, old uh, hog killer who was reaching his zenith uh, as, as a, uh, uh, 
a feared creature in the forests, I guess, around Calistoga, to the point right. where finally he had killed so many hogs and, and so many other farm animals that uh, Calistoga had put together a posse uh, to go out and hunt him down. Does that sound correct? Yes, it does. Okay. And this posse was fronted by, I think, three of the Cyrus boys, uh, apparently, according to this story. And they hunted this bear down and chased him around the, the hillsides. And at one point, they had the bear trapped uh, on a ridge. But the bear himself, as they were shooting at him, rolled himself in a ball and rolled down the hill to escape them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, I've heard that story. <laughs> it, well, it's a great story. Not to mention the fact, if you can find this book, it's got a great picture of, of the bear rolling down the hill. <laughs> it's a, it's, this is so much fun to read this story. And in the end, uh, it was uh, uh, pleasant uh, Hi- Cyrus's dogs had treed Old Hog Killer. And so with Old Hog Killer up in the tree, uh, they had to decide who would shoot the bear himself. And because it was Pleasant Cyrus's dogs, and he wanted to make sure that his dogs didn't get shot, in the scuffle, and also because he was quite possibly the best shot in the crew, uh, they climbed him up in a tree to be adjacent to Old Hog Killer and handed him several rifles. Uh, he would yeah. he would unload the rifle in the bear, and it took 21 shots to kill him, or at least mm-hmm. it took many shots. And when they finally, Old Hog Killer finally succumbed and fell out of the tree, and when they finally got to him, he had 21 uh, bullet holes in him. Yeah. And a very large bear skin. Apparently, supposedly they they hung it out on on the side of a barn. It was that large. That's the story that I'd read. Mm-hmm. And yeah. is that the story that Calistoga is going with? Yes, it is. And um, you know, there, there's also uh, parts of that story where you know when they're in pursuit of the bear, um, he turns tail and, and chases them. And uh, there's one uh, instant where. One of the, a couple of the, um, the hunters were just so fearful that they were, they were found hugging trees. <laughs> so, you know, it was just like, well, that would be kind of frightening. And it, it makes for a great story. <laughs> really and, uh, I mean, this is one wily bear to yeah. say, okay, I'm just going to turn myself into a big ball and roll down, <laughs> roll the, down. the hill so I can uh, yeah. elude them. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great story. And it, it just adds um, some depth and color to what life was like in the earliest days of settling Napa County. And I think that's one reason why it is in the books and it's in um, why it gets so much press. It, it, picks, it paints a picture of a time and a way of life that none of us could really relate to. Yeah. And it helps us appreciate what it was like. And, you know, John Cyrus, Lavina Graves' um, husband, he wrote a letter to their daughter, Elizabeth Cyrus Wright, and she ended up being a librarian in Calistoga, describing what the area was like prior to um, a great deal of settlement. They said it was like an unfenced park. Yeah. And it's a beautiful letter uh, it goes on for quite a, a long, it's quite lengthy, so I wouldn't dare quote it now. But um, it's just like, oh, it just sounds so wonderful. Um, you bet, and it would have been. that it was just so beautiful. And then the sun goes down, and you got to find a safe place to sleep. Yes. <laughs> and, you, know, you just climb up in a tree. You climb up in a tree. <laughs> the town should be named after Old Hog Killer. That's my position, officially. <laughs> there you go. He's, he's the real hero of the story. Well, <laughs> you, you know, when you get through all of it, uh, the George Yant and, and uh, Edward Bale and, and Sam Brannan and, and the Graves family and the Cyruses and all of that, there, there are so many people that, that would equally be uh, 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 aptly named after, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of great characters found at Calistoga and a lot of great stories. Oh, definitely. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as far as the, the history of Calistoga and the individuals that have lived there. I mean, if you bring it uh, further you know, forward as far as the timeline, uh, there are people more recent, uh, especially like during Prohibition. Uh, there's some great stories. So uh, our accounts would be a better way to say it. Accounts, yeah. Well, you know, um, 
I would love to do another one of these Calistoga centric ones with you at some point if you were ever interested. Um, oh, definitely. Because there's, I mean, how else do you end this episode than how we just did <laughs> Old Hog Killer, and the, hog and killer. then the way you two just summed it up was very beautiful. Because um, it is, you know, it still is sort of like an unfenced park. I mean, you there yeah. still is that beauty up it's there. A beautiful town. That um, y- yes, it is very developed, and it's going to continue to get more developed, but. There's just a sense of beauty and wonder up there that still exists um, in 2020. It's it's oh, it's, it's it's even different than uh, than Sonoma County. I mean, there's just they're both beautiful places, but there's yeah. something special about Napa County and Calistoga in particular. And um, yeah. you know, uh, we have more than half of the outline here that we didn't get to. And uh, yeah. I think I think that an hour and a half to two hour episode is a, a good start here. You know, we're we're at such a, a weird point in our history right now. So it's, I don't even feel like I want to say go up and visit Calistoga now because I don't know if Calistoga would like to have a lot of visitors coming into their area until we get done with this pandemic. They've dealt with them before and uh, California has throughout its history. And uh, I think it's uh, one day and one day soon when everything gets reopened, definitely if you're looking for a place to explore uh, a wonderful day trip, uh, a trip up to Calistoga, would would be a wonderful way to spend an afternoon or a, a night, spend the night. Uh, but they'll be happy if you go and spend some money there pretty soon. Uh, Calistoga embodies the the true personality, the history, and the flavor of Napa County. You look at it, and it's just like this is where it began, and you can still see it. Where in many other places you can't. So it's a, it still reflects where we started, and you can see where we are, and you can envision the future. It's a beautiful town, and um, I, I'm just really thrilled that we got to, to talk about it tonight, and that hopefully there will see, be some people that listen to this that learn something about the area. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the whole idea. So I hope that we can do another one of these sometime. I hope that um, we can hit some other Sonoma County and Napa County towns, Tom, in the in the months to come. As long as we have to navigate this, uh, the, the shutdown and the pandemic, this is sort of a, a new thing that we're planning to do more of. So, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Your work can be found in the Napa Valley Register on a regular basis. Is that correct? Yes, it can. Uh, my column runs every other week uh, for the time being. And it's all local history, Napa County history. And you you have a book coming out at some point in the next, hopefully, year. Is that correct? Well, actually, um, I have a book coming out in October, October 1st. What is the book centering on? Well, it's called Spirited Napa Valley. That's Uh the working title. And it's a local ghost story. Yes. Uh, October, perfect time to come out. As it gets closer, let's talk, because I think it'd be very fun to shine a light on that project as well, if you want to come back and join us. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And I would be very open to talking more about Calistoga history um, and, you know, other history throughout Napa County. There's some really fascinating stories. All right. Yeah. Well, we will do it again. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it was thank an, you so much. It was an absolute delight, and we look forward to hopefully doing another one of these with you soon. Yeah.